I have a, the great um, honor to introduce a, a colleague, Matis Vakanagel, we go back some time together, um, who has, I think, perhaps more than anyone, demonstrated the power of communication in changing the way institutions see their responsibility towards something. I don't think, Matis, come on up, that you could have ever conceived when you were first testing out ecological footprinting in cities um, 15 years ago, uh, 20 years ago, that um, it would have been adopted by industries, by national governments, by international agencies, by NGOs. Everyone is using this concept. And I think we need to look to the story of the uh, global footprint as one ICLEI can learn from as how we can communicate and scale up awareness about our issues. So uh, we owe Mattis a tremendous applause. We can learn a great deal from him. Uh, Mattis is also a great fellow traveler to ICLEI and that we are part of a generation of people who are trying to figure out ways to quantify and communicate and engage. And you've done a great deal, but you've done one thing in particular before I give you the mic. You've thrown an immense challenge at us by not pulling any punches. You've shown to us in the clearest and simplest of terms just how much we're going to hit a brick wall and what we're looking for you uh, from you this morning and the challenge before you, and I'm sure you'll rise to it, is to show us, is there a way out? Is there some way we and the way we develop our cities can deal with it? So let's hear about the Golden Way, Matt. Thank you. Welcome, dear fellow travelers on this wonderful planet. It's a great honor to be with you, to be associated with this marvelous organization of ICLEI. Uh, particular tribute to Jeb, who has started it how many years ago? 20? Wow. And uh, Conrad and, and uh, Mariana and I think 70 staff from around the world. So the Margaret Mead idea of small groups changing the world really comes to life here and I congratulate them all and even more so the members because without the members that bring all this knowledge to the forefront uh, I think we wouldn't have been able to make this progress and I think the future really depends on you because about 80 percent if not more of the resource consumption of any individual is determined by the way cities are built so you really have the future of humanity in your hand. And what I would like to do today is to start with weaving together the various trends that we have seen over the last two days, uh, try to make sense of them, and then um, find out what does it mean for cities. And really the good news is the following. I think we are blocked by one of the major policy misconceptions that we think it's not in our interest to act. I would submit, if you look at the trends and if you believe we are moving into an ecologically constrained future, there is no better investment than to get your city ready. Your city doesn't change from one day to another. If you're stuck with a city that is resource inefficient and we are hit with resource constraints, you're stuck with the resource constraints. Nobody will bail you out. So in some ways, recognizing that yes, there's a global issue, but many, many of the benefits, independent of how Copenhagen will turn out, will turn back to your city, will tell you that these immense investments will be paying off very, very handsomely. Now, let me look at the trends again. Essentially, this summary put together by Will Steffen uh, from Australia, this shows how we have moved over the last 250 years. Rapid expansion in all domains from population, um, damming of rivers, uh, uh, fisheries that have been more and more exploited, all showing this upward trend. Now you can have two possible interpretations. One is to say, if it's happening everywhere, it must be normal. Why worry? Another interpretation may be to say, actually, they're compounding each other. Uh, that really is worrisome. And so the next question then becomes to say, so how long can we continue to this expansion? Are there upper limits? How do they add up together? And that's why I believe we truly are moving into a new era. An era that is shifting attention from what we called in the 20th century developing countries and developed countries. I think a distinction that we need to bury uh, to one 
where we see the difference between ecological creditors and ecological debtors. What do I mean by that? When I was born, most countries had more ecological capacity within their own boundaries than what residents in these countries consume for food, fiber, everything. Today, this is how the situation look like, looks like. Only about 20% of the world population lives in countries that have more capacity than what they use for themselves. doesn't mean that they use these ecosystems wisely or well. It just means that they have more than what they use. So this is a difference in my lifetime. So more and more, as we run into ecological constraints, your access to ecological assets as a city or as a country becomes a driving factor for securing your long-term well-being. Now, how do we know that? We've developed a tool called the Ecological Footprint, and some summary is on this little ticket that you may have gotten on your table. But essentially, it builds on thinking like a farmer. A farmer knows how big is their farm, how many cows can he put on it. If you put too many cows on your farm, they get awfully skinny. It doesn't work. So there's a relationship between how big your farm is and what you can extract from it. So ecological footprint accounting, like you do with money, you want to know how much do you earn, how much do you spend. The footprint does it in terms of how much nature is there, how much ecologically productive space is there on this planet that provides ecological services, forests, wetlands, fisheries, cropland, etc. That's what we have. That's the biocapacity. And then vice versa. How much does it take to produce all the resources that I consume and to absorb the corresponding waste? Again, ecological services that I depend on. Even now, it's not, only, it's not even 11 o'clock, I've only already used resources from at least three continents. You know, uh, coffee, perhaps from Colombia, um, orange juice, who knows? So it all adds up. Wheat, um, cotton. So as you add up the amount of resources it takes and you compare it with how much is available, you can see to what extent uh, we fit within the constraints of the biosphere. Now, if you want to know more about the details, and I will go, won't go into it, you can come to our website, and there are lots of documents that explain how we calculate it. But we even go a step further. Because if we put up some numbers, you know, it's just a bunch of people putting up some numbers. It's not our risk if the numbers are wrong. That's why we engage with nations. We want to have 10 nations to adopt the ecological footprint like GDP. And they need to test, is this number an accurate description of how much biocapacity they have, how much biocapacity there is in the world, and how much they use. And these are the first countries that have started research, research collaborations with us to test to what extent uh, we are on the right track. And globally, if you add everything up, this is the cake we see. When I was born, about half of the planet's capacity was used by humanity. Now we use capacity about 30% faster than can be regenerated. How is that possible? It's possible to pump water more rapidly out of the ground than it recharges. It's possible to cut trees more rapidly than they regrow. It's possible to fish more rapidly than fish gets restocked, etc. It's possible to spend more money than we earn. Some people realize that as well. So similarly with the word, we can, we can harvest more rapidly than what is being regenerated. But of course, it then has consequences. A big driver, as you can see, is carbon. But carbon also enables us to squeeze more out of the other ecosystems. Agriculture is so highly productive because of the easy access to fossil fuel. And if, as if Nigel showed, if that's not available, how will we be able to maintain all the yields on the other ecosystems uh, without expanding uh, their use? Now, let me just show you one curve from a country, and then we'll get to a city example. Ecuador may be one of the first countries in Latin America becoming an ecological debtor. It may not be exactly there. We don't know the numbers. We're just starting a research collaboration with Ecuador. But essentially, 40 years back, or 50 years back, they had about five times more biocapacity than footprint. Now, it's about even. If you ran any business, the question is, what would you do in such a situation? Um, diplomats there told me, but don't we have a right to develop? And our answer is exactly yes. That's why we are wanting to work with you. How can we make sure we have well-being in the future? What we are now preparing for is more the right to collapse. That's probably not the best way forward. How can we secure well-being? That's really the core question. Now, let me give you another view of how, does it make, how this may 
play out.